and a very warm welcome to this event on climate positive solutions for sustainable transport in Cambridge. Uh, this is part of the Cambridge Zero uh, Climate Change Festival, so uh, delighted to see so many people uh, here with us uh, this afternoon. I'm just going to burn my screen down a little bit, I need to see a little bit more of me. Um, so uh, just a, a few words of housekeeping uh, from me to begin with. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martin Garrett. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of Cambridge Cleantech, which is the uh, membership organisation for environmental goods and services or clean tech companies in the uh, Cambridge region. And we also have with us, I've noticed uh, this afternoon, some of our colleagues from Oxfordshire Green Tech, of which we're a founding partner. So we sort of run that jointly with other partners in Oxfordshire as our sort of sister organisation, linking together the uh, Oxford to Cambridge corridor, you might uh, say, um, as well. So a couple of points on housekeeping. If you could keep your uh, microphones on mute, please. If you do have a question, uh, please do type it in the chat box, which is in the centre of your console uh, on the screen. And either I'll read those out if it's a pressing question as we go through the uh, speakers, or if not, we'll raise that in the ample time, the half an hour we have for a Q&A at the end uh, of the session. Uh, just to let you know as well that we are recording uh, this session this afternoon and it will be available on our website uh, from tomorrow. And we also have two or three members of the Cambridge Clean Tech team with us uh, this afternoon, so Ori Ann, who's been helping out just so far, uh, Cynthia and also Sylvie, who's actually put the whole um, agenda together for us. So that's a bit of housekeeping in terms of background. Um, at Cambridge Clean Tech, what we've been doing in particular to support our members is providing opportunities in terms of access to finance. So we have our Clean Tech Venture Week coming up in two weeks time. 28 of the most investment ready Clean Tech companies will be presenting to a room full of investors a digital e-room from investors, a bit like today's event um, in, those, in that last week in November. So watch this space for that one if you're interested. Take a look at our events page. And also we've been helping members again in these difficult times with contract opportunities. So recently we did um, a major uh, trawl of Polish corporates. We had six Polish corporates that were looking for innovative solutions. Uh, we've worked with Cambridge Display Technology in a similar vein uh, recently. And on our events page again at the moment, you can see a couple of uh, innovation challenges from the municipalities of Delft in the Netherlands and Espo in Finland, who are looking for particular solutions for energy um, district heating and energy in their districts, more energy efficiency in those districts as they develop them. So that's the sort of thing we do for members basically as an organisation. And we're very keen to develop the clean tech cluster in the community uh, in the Cambridge and Oxford uh, regions uh, in the UK. So enough about us. Let's get on to what you're really here to hear about, and those are the speakers. So, Oriane, if you could just move the um, slide forward, thank you. You can see there we've got some terrific speakers. They've got just five minutes each, so the sort of what we call elevator pitches. It's the amount of time you have if you get into an elevator in New York City and you're going from the first floor to the top floor, you've got five minutes to put your case to the chief executive that you bump into, or in this case, it's our audience this afternoon. So, without further ado, We'll hear from Rob King, who's the founder of Zedify, talking about the last mile. Over to you, Rob. Super. Thanks, Martin, for the warm welcome. Um, well, I can't think of a more apt time to talk about uh, deliveries and the impact that they are having on uh, climate change than now. We're in the middle of a second lockdown, which means everyone's at home um, ordering like uh, fury online uh, to get ready for Christmas. So. <laughs> Most people won't be impacted on this and won't see much change, but there is obviously more and more uh, vans on the roads, more and more pollution, more and more congestion. Uh, and Zedify is all about doing deliveries better and trying to provide, I suppose, a, a bit of an antidote to um, that scenario that we're in. Um, and by better, I mean better for our customers in terms of doing deliveries the way that they want, but also better for our cities in terms of um, reducing emissions, reducing congestion, and helping to make our cities a nicer place to be. And essentially that's what drives myself and all of my colleagues um, to, to do the best job we can. So, um, try to move this forward. There we go. Um, so what exactly is the problem? Well, fundamentally we have got a changing urban landscape. We've got rampant congestion in our cities. Uh, not just um, on the streets, but also on the um, curve side. Uh, and that means that traditional delivery drivers often get frustrated, they miss time slots, and that often leads to a really poor delivery experience. 
Um, but we also got very topically at the moment, the issue of pollution, and that is driving customer demand to say, we want our deliveries to be zero emission. We want them to be more ethical. And it's also driving local authorities to start restricting access in city centers to make them um, uh, cleaner and um, less congestion, less polluted. Uh, and finally, I think it's worth saying that we've got a fairly old system whereby uh, traditional delivery hubs are situated many, many miles outside of a city area. Um, and they use vehicles that are very good and well optimized for driving up and down the M1, but not particularly well suited for delivering around a modern city. Um, and that means they also can't, um, they don't have that flexibility to be able to deliver the sort of na narrow time slots that us as consumers are uh, beginning to demand. So Zetify solves these problems and um, at the same time helps to enhance our client's brand. We provide a really fantastic doorstop, uh, a doorstep experience um, with active and living wage employed staff. We use um, zero emission vehicles, mostly cargo bikes, and they are optimized for the city environment. They can get around the city very, very easily and access all restricted areas. Um, and we also can offer our customers the narrow time slots um, that they are demanding in terms of starting to think about convenience and, and, and saying, well, actually, I want my delivery to be in the evening when I'm actually going to be in, it, in rather than any time the next day. So how do we do it? Um, our solution is essentially um, utilizing micro consolidation hubs on the edge of urban areas, uh, and they act as a gateway for deliveries coming into and out of um, that area. They're very close to the delivery area, so um, we can often do multiple routes. Our cargo bikes will do two, three, or four routes in a day, so it gives us lots more flexibility. Um, and when the deliveries come to those uh, consolidation hubs, we remode to electric vehicles, mostly e-cargo bikes, um, and they can get around the cities um, really quickly and efficiently. And finally, we tie all that together with our own um, tech solution that we've um, put together um, to optimize those deliveries and make sure that our clients get the best experience in real-time tracking. So in terms of our services and what we offer to um, businesses, we, um, we, we work with local um, businesses offering not just same day deliveries in their area. We don't do the kind of fast, urgent delivery style deliveries, but um, offering consolidated deliveries so they're a better price um, in the local area. But we also do next day national deliveries. And our bit of that is to do the collections for our customers. So if you're a local retail shop, rather than have your DHL van come into the city, we, um, we do those collections. They come back to our consolidation hub where they get consolidated and DHL will come and pick up hundreds of deliveries rather than trying to go and collect ones and twos and threes and small uh, numbers of, of parcels. One minute, um, please, Rob. Um, and then finally, we do first and last mile delivery for large uh, businesses, um, a lot of 3PLs like TNT, APC, Yodel, etc., but also for uh, national retailers. And we work with over 250 customers. Uh, in the past year, we delivered over 300,000 items across our nine now UK depots. And as an example, some of our customers that we work with, both local and national. My computer's crashed. <laughs> so it's probably about time to um, close off. I think I've probably got about 30 seconds left. Um, but just to uh, finally sort of put that um, out there. Oh, there we go. We're, we're growing. Uh, we're currently in nine different depots. We've got a new uh, depot opening up in Bristol in January and um, really excited about uh, the times ahead and, and helping to uh, alleviate some of those big issues and problems that both logistics companies have, that cities have in terms of reducing emissions, but also our customers have in, in doing those deliveries the way they want. So I think that's probably about my five minutes up and I should... Um, I should uh, be quiet and uh, let the next speaker go on, but thank you Rob, for the opportunity to talk. Rob, thank you very much. That is indeed your five minutes up. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, fascinating work that you do in Cambridge with that last mile delivery for parcels and so on. Um, now, uh, next we have Tom De Wilton, who's the co-founder and also the chief operating officer of Cambridge Oxwash. And the interesting thing about both these first two companies is they both actually presented at our FinTech Venture Day in February. So uh, well done for that. And over to you, Tom. Thanks, Martin. Thank, can, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, we can do both. Excellent. Brilliant. So I've got five minutes. So I'll, um, yes, I'll get cracking. So, hello, everyone. Yeah, as Martin says, I'm Tom from, uh, from Oxwash. Um, I have taken the high-risk strategy of trying to play you a video, which, as we all know, is 
is risky over Zoom, but I'm going to give it a go. It's not very long. Um, I've scrapped the sound, but essentially just to show a bit of what we do. So we are a sustainable on-demand laundry and dry cleaning startup from Oxford. Um, we're trying to re-engineer the way the world does laundry from the bottom up. And ultimately, we are aiming for a net zero solution to the commercial laundry industry. Why are we doing this? It's because um, not many people know, but the commercial laundry industry is outrageously polluting. Um, that's for lots of reasons, and not least uh, the urban logistics involved in uh, every time you sleep in a, some pristine white sheets in your, your hotel, uh, chances are those sheets have been driven for tens, if not hundreds of miles by one of the articulated lorries that Rob mentioned are so good on the, uh, on the M1, but not good cruising around the streets of Cambridge. Um, so that was the solution we, we uh, acted to solve first. And that's where our electric cargo bikes come into play. Um, so we exclusively use electric cargo bikes for our uh, urban logistics. We only operate within city centers at the moment. That is looking to change. Um, and we find that the, the cargo bikes are absolutely brilliant um, for our last mile logistics. Uh, what else do we do? Um, in terms of the actual laundry side of it, we wash at ambient temperature. So that means that instead of heating water up to ludicrously high temperatures, 60, 70, 80 degrees, we are washing at 18 to 20 degrees. Um, that means, of course, we're using less energy. Uh, the clothes and the items we wash last up to three times longer. Uh, and of course, yeah, it also benefits our unit economics. How do we do that? We use this fancy thing called ozone. Um, for the chemist amongst us, it's uh, O3, three oxygen molecules combined. And essentially that means that we can kill the bugs, remove the odors at that very low temperature without using really aggressive, horrible, bleached based um, chemistry. Uh, we're obviously you know, huge on the microfiber filtration that I'm sure you've all heard about. You know, this idea that uh, microscopic plastics are finding their way into the food chain and then into us. Um, so we are essentially trying to build a vertically integrated full stack solution to the laundry industry, of which the logistics um, are a key point. Here's a very well uh, curated photo of us in London where we've just launched a little overview of our company. We're now actually up to 21 full-time employees. As Rob said, we pride ourselves also on being living wage employers. We were born in Oxford, where I am now. Um, we then moved to the other side, to Cambridge. Uh, we were due to launch just before, just sorry, after the lockdown. Uh, we had to push pause and unfortunately use the furlough scheme, but we have now launched in Cambridge. So if anyone is in Cambridge and would like to try us out, I would be very grateful for any feedback. Um, me a message and I can send you a promo code uh, and our key stat is that we save 174 kilograms of CO2 for every ton of laundry processed with the Oxwash method uh, and I think that 3.25 tons is probably now outdated and more up to four tons of CO2 saved by doing your laundry with Oxwash as opposed to one of our competitors. One minute, um, Tom. Thanks Martin. Uh, the elephant in the room, COVID, we serve both individuals and businesses mainly all of the SMEs that were closed during the first lockdown. So our revenue dropped off a cliff, uh, but we're proud that we're, we're getting back up to um, pre-COVID numbers. Um, and we have also just launched our third site in London. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'd love to talk more if I'm in the panel and, uh, and questions afterwards. So thank you very much indeed. Tom, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, also from Oxford and to keep us moving, we have Dave Beasley who's the co-founder of Oxford Office Furniture, also known as Electric Dave. And that will become clear when he does his presentation. Dave, over to you. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yes, it's been an incredible journey. Um, so first of all, I'll tell you what we do. We're Oxford Office Furniture, and we do the full fulfillment uh, service from office planning to 3D designs, to installations, office moves, storage, etc. We, I was very, very lucky. We had an opportunity in 2009 to have a electric mini for six months. And being that my first two vehicles were electric minis, um, I was lucky to get on the scheme. And who would have thought, you know, some 10, 11 years later, um, we're in the environment we're in today. So um, my decision to go to EVs was really uh, very simple. The 
electric mini uh was absolutely superb um it was in the very coldest of winters i think we've ever been reported some days down to minus 15 and i was still getting a range of 60 miles on the mini at minus 15 and everybody would um shout it down but anybody that um spoke to me about it i would give them all the benefits so it was right that we went down the course and uh took up the fact that we would go down the EV route. So, okay, I'm a bit of a leader, uh, particularly in the way that we run vehicles. Unfortunately, the slide is not available. I've lost it somewhere. Dale, sorry, Dale put it together for me, but where it's gone, I don't know. Um, so we have a Mini, electric Mini. Uh, we have four Nissan Combis. Um, what is a Nissan Combi? So if you to look, look at our, our, our combers, they look like vans. They've got see-through vinyl graphics on. So they're five and seven seater units, all equipped with tow bars. And we then have, of course, the Tesla. So um, with all these vehicles, they all tow trailers as well. And uh, they are just amazing in every, every respect. So if we take the Tesla, for instance, very much a commercial vehicle, uh, we put a twin axle trailer on that um, and it wasn't so long ago we parked up outside the Oxford Town Hall and we were able to do a full fulfilment of office furniture into the Oxford City Council offices. Um, so totally uh, zero emissions all the way through. So um, the, the whole point with it is that um, there are a barrier to companies such as us so what I mean by that is that when you get bigger than a car you then get into the commercial aspect so we run lorries we run sprinters but if we were to go and buy a sprinter today we just wouldn't get the payload with the mileage it's unusable so where we go back and we use a Tesla with a twin axle trailer we both got a huge payload and we've also got um, loads and loads of miles to go to go through it. So, as I understand it, the government is still working on a, a, the idea that they're probably uh, upgrade the 3.5 tonne rule um, and go to 4.25 tonne so they can add weight in the batteries, although the payload uh, will remain as we would imagine it to be in, in a sprinter or a big transit um as it is today dave uh, so lucky, dave, uh, to... dave sorry just to let you know a couple of things first of all dale has kindly put up the photograph of your cars on his screen so if all of the people in attendance want to look at dale hoyland you'll see the picture of dave's cars fleet of cars so you know about thanks that. dale and uh, uh, dave just one minute now please thank you okay so i was very lucky uh two or three weeks ago um, I, I had a, a, a view in and, and a play with the new 18 ton uh, Volta truck. So as I've got no time left, talk to me any time. What I can say, if you don't go down the electric route, you're crazy because um, my car was serviced uh, last week and it was a hundred pound for the service. And we're talking a Tesla X here. So the cost per mile, you know, you could be running the Mini at just over a penny a, a mile. Um, if you take the Tesla, you're talking about four to five p a mile. And if you take the Nissan, two to three p a mile. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm happy for anybody to want to know more because there's more to give. Just make contact with me after the meeting or email or whatever. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Dave. We have a Q&A at the end and I'm sure they'll be um, raising questions then. Um... So the, the, the bottom line is go electric or you're crazy, I think. Crazy. I you said. crazy. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, good. Right, let's move on. Next we have Alex, Alex Murray, who's the founder of Flit. You're going to tell us all about Flit, uh, Alex. You can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Oh, um, sorry, I forgot, forgot to, to unmute first. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Put the screen back up. Um, and it's a co-founder of Flit. I would... Uh, be remiss to uh, claim to have done it all myself. Oh, thank you, Paul. 
Right, okay, so we're Flit, we're a Cambridge-based uh, company that develops electric bikes. So we do all the, the design work, um, well, everything from design and then all the way through to delivery. Um, I'm not quite sure who the audience would be today, so I'm actually gonna give you a bit of an overview and then tie it back to something at the end. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to make sure everyone's sort of on board what e with what an e-bike actually is. The e-bike on the left is, well, any e-bike is a bike where you pedal and the most boosts what you do. The e-bike on the left is what they looked like in about 2006. Uh, it looks like a pretty bog standard bike. It's got a lead acid battery that itself weighs about 15 to 20 kilos. The bike on the right is what a modern e-bike looks like. That's the Van Moth um, that has lithium ion batteries fully built into the frame. The motors are more efficient. It's got sensors all over it. Um, if your bike gets stolen, they can track it down anywhere in the world. So a lot of the tech driving changes in e-bikes are around batteries, motors, sensors, integration of components, connectivity, and using new materials. Uh, e-bikes have also gathered a lot of attention because in recent years it's become quite apparent that not only are they a quick, efficient, and fun way to get around, they're actually still pretty good for your health. The main takeaway from most studies is that people who ride e-bikes ride further and they ride more often, um, which means compared to normal bikes, you get about the same health benefit. This has led to an enormous growth in cycling. So this chart just shows uh, e-bike sales across Europe over the last uh, 10 plus years. Uh, you can see it's pretty immune to recessions um, and it's been growing very strongly pre-COVID. COVID has only increased the rate of growth. Um, and what you've also seen is there's been an explosion of different types of bikes. You've got everything from the big bikes that Robin, Robin Tom was showing you, the big cargo bikes, all the way down to what we develop, which is uh, folding bikes for commuters or anyone who needs to keep a bike in a bit of tight space. In the UK, we're actually way behind this curve. About 4% of bikes sold in the UK are electric. Whereas in France, it's 15%. In the Netherlands, it's 42%. So we could grow 10 times and just to reach the level seen in the Netherlands. So we develop, we develop uh, lightweight folding electric bikes. They can be used for anything from taking on the train with you to uh, we've got one customer who wants to take it in his helicopter. Fair enough, that's not, not very usual for us, but there are all sorts. Um, we uh, design this from the ground up. So this just shows some of the activities we do, everything from CAD design through to prototyping. That second picture is a fully 3D printed bike that we use for testing. Uh, we work with the manufacturers and do all the design for manufacturing and we also do the distribution. But actually, what I really want to do is what we're planning to do next. We've just won a large grant from Innovate UK to develop a new electric bike that uh, is built around circular economy principles. So this means the bike will be uh, designed to be locally manufactured um, here in the UK or, or in the mar other markets we sell into. Um, it means that it's going to be modular. So if any damage occurs to the bike, you don't have to scrap the whole bike. You can actually just replace individual parts. And we're also using some new materials uh, that will assist in, in uh, remanufacturing as well. Um, to do that though, we want to look at leasing models. So my pitch today is really, um, we are currently developing this bike and if there are any companies, particularly local to Cambridge, who are interested in getting their staff on bikes, on e-bikes, um, and think a folding bike could be useful for that, uh, we'd love to chat with you. Um, our engineering team uh, would love your, your um, input into the design process um, and it gives you a chance to to have the, the bike designed a bit for, for your specific needs. One um, minute, Alex, please. Sure. So the advantage of the, the leasing model for us is um, it's pretty cheap up front. Um, the bikes are always there for you. They're easy to maintain and actually we would handle all the maintenance. We'd be able to take them back, reuse them, uh, repurpose them, remanufacture them. Uh, and we would also bundle in services such as uh, the maintenance, insurance, etc. So that's a really, um, Low stress way to operate. Uh, those are my questions. If anyone wants to get in touch, I'm more than happy to help. Thank you. Alex, terrific. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and congratulations on the Innovate UK success as well. Well done.
Um, right, let's keep moving. A couple more uh, speakers. Next up, we have Francis Wright, who's going to uh, talk to us about the community cycle scheme at Orchard Park. Over to you, Francis. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's get going. Um, right, we're slightly at the end. Look at back. Right, so I'm going to be talking about Orchard Park's shared electric trike project. It's funded by South Cambridgeshire District Council with grant funding from their Zero Carbon Communities Initiative. And it's hosted by the co-housing group at Marmalade Lane. Um, and I would, this, so this is an image of Marmalade Lane. It's the heart of the co-housing community of 42 households. And I suppose this, this gives some context. When you make it easy for people to collaborate, when you know your neighbours, then a whole load of things happen naturally. So we share our washing machines, our gardens, um, other tools, our lawnmower, our gar um, a printer, a library of things. We offer unwanted food and household items and clothes between ourselves. And we recently started an on-site internal shop. And car parking is at the side of the development, enabling this lane to be car free. So it becomes this great place for people to play and for parents to meet. So, and some of the car parking is along the southern boundary of the shared garden, and that um, provides a real incentive for residents to reduce their car ownership and get more garden space between us. And so last summer, we purchased an electric car between 10 households. It's now shared by 15 households and it's supplemented by uh, an old smart petrol car for resilience. And no one in the community has more than one car parking space. So the clubs helps people who have both no car and those who um, otherwise might want access to a second car. And it also enables those people who want to use an electric car to reduce their impact whenever they can. So I'm not going to go into detail about that, but it, it works very simple, very low tech in terms of the admin and the booking. We split all the costs um, depending on usage and also per household. So, but from the record keeping we, we kept about people's usage, we realized that um, it was being used for a lot of journeys that were about five miles or less, probably round trips to the shops. And so, and that was despite there being a multitude of bikes and cargo bikes within the community. So when the grant opportunity came along, we already had the germs of an idea for an electric cargo trike that could be shared on the same basis of the car, but, but within the wider Orchard Park community. And so just stepping back from that tiny into the big picture, we know transport is the biggest, um, sector for us in terms of CO2s. We can do something about that. When you look at how that's broken down, you can see that actually it's private car usage that is the biggest single chunk. And we also know that we need to, because of the forecast growth in both ownership and use, the sort of shift to electric cars isn't going to be enough. We need to reduce personal car ownership and personal car usage. And so we, we thought the electric cargo trike was something that might fit in that pic picture. So here is the uh, cargo trike being delivered by out, um, Rob from Outspoken Bikes. And I think one of the things I'd reflect on is that so many sharing solutions are corporate facilitated app based products. And one minute, Francis, please. Yeah, Sorry, thank you. That's okay. And we think community led initiatives are really important in terms of the additional benefit that comes from doing it that way and building resilient social networks which we need to face the challenges ahead and it also it often outside of a city centre it's not profitable for bike sharing and car sharing to operate well so they're a vital part of the mix and our approach as with um, the car is very low tech there are 18 households and 28 users currently paying a membership fee of 40 pounds a year there is no other charge it's booked um, online in a diary just a google diary there's a slack channel for communication it's based in one of our bin stores it's all insured 
I know the time, once COVID permits, we hope to be promoting it so that other people in Orchard Park can use it. So it's very simple. The most complicated thing was getting insurance. And that, that's, that's me. Francis, thank you very much. I like that. It looks a bit like an auto rickshaw, doesn't it, that you see in <laughs> India, the, the shape of it and everything, but fantastic. It's great to hear from the consumer demand side, as well as hearing from the supply side uh, today. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Uh, now, before I hand over to Sylvie, who's going to um, oversee the Q&A session, we have our final speaker. Uh, last but by no means least, we have Roxanne Debut who's the Executive Director at CamCycle. Roxanne, over to you. Hi Martin, thanks for having me. Let's get this presentation up and running. Excellent, we working? Yes. Great, uh, I hope everyone's heard of CamCycle. Um, if not, uh, we are also known as the Cambridge Cycling Campaign and this year we celebrated our 25th anniversary of working for more better <laughs> and safer cycling for all ages and abilities in and around Cambridge. Um, for us, it's about more than the bikes and more about the uh, cyclists and, and whatever image you might have about what a cyclist is. We're actually about making a, a better place to live, uh, having healthier lifestyles, uh, giving children back their independence, being able to play, uh, improving our air quality, reducing climate change, and particularly for this audience, enabling better places to, to do business and better ways of doing business, um, all enabled through cycling. Uh, now we are the cycling capital of the UK here in Cambridge, uh, but we've got plenty of room to move, uh, plenty of room to improve. Uh, so we've got about, um, depending on how you look at it, 30% plus of residents in Cambridge cycle to work every day in normal times. Uh, but there are still so many people who say they would cycle if cycling infrastructure was better, if they felt safer. And we see statistics about this across the UK as well, uh, particularly now that the pandemic has given people an opportunity to see what our streets could be like with fewer cars. Uh, Cam Cycle is also famous for the Reach Ride. Uh, we have a thousand people join us on a bike ride from Cambridge to the fair in the village of Reach. Hopefully we can do that again next year, but it might be 2022. Uh, we also have our Cambridge Festival of Cycling. Uh, again, had to cancel it this year, but uh, uh, in previous years it's even been mentioned in the House of Commons. Um, and we have over 20 events um, in the month of September for our Festival of Cycling. Uh, we also produce lots of helpful uh, materials, posters about cycle lighting, uh, little battery charging packs to charge your bike lights on the go, and videos and leaflets about safe and uh, responsible cycling. But we are mostly known for our campaigning and we are persistent. CamCycle is a membership organisation. We have over 1,550 members, actually it's 60 members as of today. Um, and our most famous win recently was um, pushing back on the Cambridge Station planning application, uh, which was quite a, a precedent in being refused based on the government's new cycling infrastructure design guidelines but it wasn't just those guidelines it was years of cam cycle pushing and pushing to make that better so let's see what happens with Cambridge station hopefully they come back with better designs what we are asking for and what will help you with your supply chains with your cargo bikes is complete networks a cycling network is only as good as its weakest link we need those protected separated cycle lanes so that children can cycle on them Cargo bike couriers can cycle on them, older people can cycle on them, people with disabilities can cycle on them. We need safe junctions like the those of the new Dutch roundabout on Fenden Road. Uh, that seems to be where we fall down on our infrastructure because that's where it's most complicated. But cyclists need to have safe space, separate infrastructure, separate timings and priority over side roads on those junctions. But we also need to look at traffic redu reduction and dare I say it, demand management. Uh, so we can start with filters. If we create quiet roads with less traffic on them, uh, then we create safe cycle routes. But overall, we, we really do need to look at reducing the volume of cars and the speeds of cars on our roads. 
I'm so excited by this. This is my first presentation with an actual picture of the new Chisholm Trail, Abbey Chesterton Bridge. It's been a drawing up until now, but this is something CampCycle has worked on for 20 years. It was Jim Chisholm's idea. We called it the Chisholm Trail. We documented it and we have pushed for 20 years and it is so close to being there. Uh, and one minute, uh, please, uh, Roxanne. I'm sorry, one minute. Thank you. Yeah. This is just one example of CampCycle's uh, forethought and just an obligatory picture of the bridge going in. We're now pushing forward, you know, what have we learned from the pandemic? What opportunities is this pandemic presenting? People are seeing our roads um, in a new light. We're seeing this as more of a social justice issue. Uh, and so our campaigning is, is pursuing those paths. And the government's coming on board with a new golden age of cycling and incredible new policies and guidance, which really will influence how our governments, our councils in bring in infrastructure. And we're seeing trials like the Mill Road Bridge, uh, you can learn more about these do guidance documents on our website, but it's worth having a look. We're amazed by the government's vision. And let's bear in mind, this is not about closing roads to cars or to business. This is about opening our roads to people. We need to think in, in our, uh, think about our public spaces like our roads in a new way. So please, if you like this, if CamCycle is helping your business, please support us. You can be a member, a corporate supporter organize or host an event, for example, as part of the Festival of Cycling, advertise in our magazine or donate. And a quick little pitch, we're also recruiting trustees. Um, so if you've got some great experience and you'd like to help shape uh, the way that we shape Cambridge, I'd love to hear from you. And that's how you can find us. Thank you. Roxanne, fantastic. I think you're going to stand over us until we sign up by the sound of it. I will. I'm not going to <laughs> stop sharing my screen until I've got some sign ups. <laughs> okay, terrific. Right, I'm going to hand over to Sylvie Russell, who's the operations manager at uh, Cambridge Clean Tech and is going to handle the Q&A session. I see there's one or two questions come in already. So, uh, Sylvie, over to you. Thanks, Martin.